in search of soil. So Buzz, how would you say your background in chemical engineering has helped you when you moved into the soil space? Well, I think, it, um, you know, um, as a chemical engineer, you get trained, or any, any kind of engineer, you get trained to solve problems. So that and a background, my main background was more inorganic chemistry, more than organic chemistry. So it was more the background that I had of solving problems more than anything else. And I just saw that in soils, we, we had some issues. And you may or may not know this, but um, my undergrad was chemical engineering and my PhD was actually in aquatic sciences. And within about five years, I was already thinking about quitting aquatic sciences just because I saw huge problems in water pollution, but no way out of being able to fix those huge problems. Um, my understanding at the time was that soils were these static bodies and that, yeah, it's nice to know about them, but uh, I, it, was, it never occurred to me that soils could change. And you, you probably have heard of this, but I, that changed when I met Ray Archuleta. And I want to think it was about February 2010. And um, in the space of about a morning, he completely changed the way, at least the, the way I looked at life, I looked at soils. And, and that changed everything. So my back, again, back to your question, my background gave me a basic discipline of being able to solve problems. But a lot of the static mindset that I brought, I had to actually unlearn. Do does that answer your question? It, it does. And do you think that you had an advantage coming in to soils the way you did where you weren't brought up through the university system of learning conventional ag teachings. And you might've came through with a mindset of how soils were, but you had that problem solving mindset. You, so you kind of came in, you talked to somebody like Ray and now it's like, okay, I don't, I'm not entrenched into some sort of ideology or thought process. You can adapt where I think one problem a lot of people have, and this isn't a soil thing. This is an every industry thing is they've been in it so long. It's hard for them to think outside the box, to shift paradigms, did you coming from the outside, do you think that's helped with how you've approached soil science? I, th I think that it's a two-edged sword. It certainly helps you because you, especially if you don't come from a particular university, you're, you're not bowing to the holy writ of the local or the, or the state fertilizer recommendations. You know, nutrient management was kind of the thing that I kind of got into. So, you're certainly not beholden to your professors and, and the leaders um, in a particular land grant university. But, um, you know, I think on the other hand, uh, there's a disadvantage in that I've had to kind of get up to speed on things like plant physiology on my own as well. So I think that there's both a, a disadvantage and advantage. And, um, you know, when you when you dive into th the whole thing with both feet, you, you make a lot of mistakes. And I think I've made a lot of mistakes, you know, over the last 10 years. Now, what's been the biggest mistake that you've made that has really helped you use that as a stepping stone to evolve knowledge? I, I would probably say the biggest mistake that I've made has been... Um, to ignore uh, mineral nutrition, not, not so much the more on NPK kind of nutrition, you know, just pile hundreds and hundred pounds, but I've been dismissive about the role of things like uh, micronutrients. Um, and I'm, I'm only beginning to catch that up. So my, I, I think it's worked. I, I've been lucky with the farmers that I've worked and given advice. I've said, you don't need to apply phosphorus and potassium fertilizer to grow a crop. You don't need to apply as much nitrogen. You've got to follow the five principles of soil health. But um, 
you know, the guys have managed to get through because they were good farmers. But um, I think accelerating the process of regeneration, um, you've got other people who uh, have done a lot better in terms of beginning to understand things like micronutrients, foliar application of uh, those things and, and also of um, um, composts. So, mm. so again, you know, um, I threw the baby out with the bathwater and saying, well, you don't have to apply NPK to grow a crop, but um, I remained somewhat agnostic about some of the very vital roles that were being played uh, in micronutrients. Um, and 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 part of that, you know, is is also realizing the impact of things like uh, nitrogenous uh, fertilizers, and then a lot of our pesticides and herbicides, uh, like some of the guys from Acres USA call the uh, the devil's pantry, um, and some of the harm that they do in sequestering uh, a lot of the essential nutrients we have. So we may do a plant tissue test. And say, oh my goodness, we've got all the micronutrients we need, and yet those might be sequestered um, in the plant itself. So that's, I, I think, I threw out the baby with the bathwater there. Yeah. So just you're focusing on the bigger, but missing the micro. And I've talked to some people who view micronutrients as they're obviously needed for plant physiology, but they are available in the soil if the biology is there to unlock it, be that our muscular mycorrhizal fungi and other soil microorganisms that can break those down and get those in contact with the plant roots. Where do you stand now in terms of the importance of these micronutrients when it comes to plant growth in the soil? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I would put myself firmly in the school of if if you're doing the you know you're doing the cover crops, you're, you're keeping the soil uh, not you're, you're not disturbing the soil. You've got diversity, and then incorporate incorporating livestock. I'm definitely of the opinion that we can unlock those things. Um, so so I, I haven't changed that, but. I, I do think that things like micronutrients, and again, I, I'm still in kindergarten, but I think uh, micronutri the, the judicious use of micronutrients and even small amounts of um, uh, other macronutrients in the so in the in foliar applications may unlock a lot of the potential of the soil, especially in degraded soil. Um, one of the things I've become more aware of is the role of calcium um, that, I, that I'd never heard about, for instance. So that's, I'm trying to um, experiment with that over here uh, in pot tests and things like that to see, well, if I apply calcium to the soil, how, for instance, would that help my vegetation, vegetative growth? And those are questions that I'm still working on. Yeah, and I think when some people hear of studies like that, they they want to turn to an amendment. And there's a huge industry out there that sells stuff to farmers and gardeners to put on the soil. And you can just see boxes and boxes of it. When it comes to these um, micronutrients and even macronutrients, do you think it's the problem is us not adding them to the soil? Because when people say, well, they're important, they're not in the soil how do they get there if I don't put them there? Where do you stand on that? <laughs> well, I, I, I would imagine there's a balance. Let, let me tell you some of the stories that I've seen over the last five or six years where um, there's a particular, there, there are a couple of operations that I've consulted to for the last five, six years. Um, and for instance, um, uh, uh, and in one of the studies I did, for instance, we uh, did not apply potassium to a certain set of static plots, 10 static plots. We didn't apply potassium for four years, and we took six crops, corn, wheat, soybean crops, so uh, two rotations of that. And uh, we found that where we did not apply potassium, our potassium 
uh, the ending soil test potassium values were higher than where we did apply, uh, sorry, not soil, where, where we did apply fertilizer potassium. So we have seen um, that in many cases, even though you don't apply the recommended nutrient, your, your soil test value actually improves. Uh, I've seen this on uh, another couple of farms where on the one farm where we haven't applied any phosphorus or potassium for several years and those values pretty much hold steady. They go up and they go down depending on the weather. Um, where we have applied chicken litter uh, in two years out of three, we've actually seen steady increases in soil test phosphorus, not a surprise, but also things like increases in soil test calcium. So there's no doubt that we have witnessed um, increases in, in nutrients sometimes where those nutrients haven't been applied. And the, the thing in common with many of them is, is that they've had cover crops. One of the, the things I run into often if, if I say, hey, you know, this we haven't put we haven't put lime on this place for several years and the pH has stayed steady. Um, and then I say, well, we put chicken litter out there two out of three years and immediately, you know, folks say, well, that's that's the thing. But where we haven't used chicken litter or lime, we've seen very, very steady values. Uh, and this is uh, in, in the, the work I've done. It's been the malic one, which is a sulfuric sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, double acid extraction. Um, so we, we just haven't seen any change, whereas, you know, five years ago, we were warned that if we didn't apply fertilizers, our, our nutrient stocks would crash, and we haven't seen that. It's a pretty interesting study, and if you think about that, for, for the average person listening to this, you start with a plot, and you're not adding anything, and, you, and you've taken a soil test up in front, so you know what the potassium value is in the soil. And then years later, it has increased, but you haven't applied potassium. Where has the potassium came from? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, <laughs> I, I listened to a lovely talk by uh, Richard Mulvaney. He was actually talking to um, uh, my, my brain's just gone dead uh, he, in a podcast. Um, and but basically, you know, the potassium. We've got more potassium in the soil than, than um, we know about. And so plant roots access that, uh, and then, of course, your mycorrhizal fungi and, and all, of the, uh, all of the biology accesses that. And, you know, soil, soils don't end at six inches. They go down into the subsoil. And in the coastal plain of South Carolina, you know, uh, with many of our good soils, between eight and 12 inches, we get into a B horizon where your clay begins to, um, uh, you, you know, your, your clay begins to increase. So even though we have um, um, one on one clays uh, with low CECs, we're still seeing quite a lot of uh, potassium. So what we know, what we seem to see is that the potassium uh, in the um, in the rock matrix becomes available through, we think, biology. Now, I'm sure there are other chemical processes. But, um, you, you know, so it, 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 it goes from, uh, from the rock matrix inaccessible to uh, what we would call exchangeable to then um, uh, to, to soluble. And these are in a dynamic equilibrium. And we think that when we add a lot of biology to the system in terms of cover crops or, you know, always having a living root, either cover crop or cash crop, we're kind of keeping that biology going. And so we're bringing that calcium from the mineral and, and um, uh, it's, it's being made, not the calcium, the, the potassium. And the same goes for something like uh, calcium as well. Do you think that one of the things we could be seeing in soils, and I, I haven't heard anybody talk on this, but when, when you spoke about clays, I started thinking about this. Are clays breaking down in soils into some of their more 
simpler elements. So clay is obviously a molecule made up of multiple elements bound together. Is biology breaking some of those bonds? So something where a clay soil, somebody thinks, oh, that can be a disadvantage. It's obviously has water holding capacity, which is an advantage. But in biology, some of that clay actually changes from clay into some of its more raw elements, which can then become plant available. Have you seen that? Or does that seem possible knowing your chemistry background? Yeah, that's something that I wouldn't necessarily be totally qualified to talk about. But certainly, you know, if you think about weathering, and in South Carolina, um, we've had a lot of, you know, for instance, cotton farming, and we lost all of our topsoil. <laughs> and so um, in some of the land where we've put, put back into, you know, woods and forests, and then also in some of the land that was spared, say, in, you know, in um, where, where people kept livestock and, and managed the, the soils well, you do see that A horizon forming. So, um, so yes, you know, clay continues to interact or the, the soil biology continues to interact with the clay. Um, carbon is added to the system through photosynthesis. And so you do see a breaking down of that. The exact mechanisms, I don't know, but certainly... You know, thinking soil tests in general, if a soil test isn't going to tell you how much phosphate's available in your soil if it's, non, if it's bound up. So in some of these systems, you know, you had phosphate increase, but your initial soil test said you had X and you've increased X to Y over that time. So the soil test missed that. And you would have thought, okay, well, I have to add minerals. I know you've seen the same thing with with other th studies, and we can get into that of, of adding nitrogen and maybe not having to add the prescribed amounts that a soil test would dictate. When you think about what data you're getting from a soil test, considering it doesn't have any sort of biological measures on it, it's really just measuring what is there now. Can you actually get valuable information off of that to work with, or is that kind of a flawed test just given what it is measuring? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And that extends to biology as well, I think. Um, I guess that the most valuable thing I can contribute to that, because I used to model water quality and uh, I stole from the water quality modeling people, but I basically have a maxim that says all soil tests are wrong, some are useful. And um, so, so first of all, um, we need to recognize that there are so many different ways of extracting nutrients from the soil. So you've got Malik 1, Malik 3, Morgan, Bray, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, the Haney extraction as well. Some of them use harsh acids. Some of them use organic acids. Um, the biggest beef that many people have with some of the newer things like Haney is, well, where are the calibrated soil tests? The, the implication being that uh, the other soil tests uh, from many land-grant universities uh, are calibrated. But um, if you start comparing, say, um, uh, Illinois and Indiana, or I think Alabama and Georgia, and you just go across the state line, you often see in um, the nutrient recommendations, if you just cross the state line, that one state might recommend about double the amount of nutrients in terms of cost uh, compared to the other state. So the question goes to which, which is real. And I think the value of any soil test is going to be based on calibrated uh returns or, or calibrated, uh, you know, looking at crops growing and how that is calibrated. And most of my understanding is certainly in my state, uh, most of the calibrated stuff um, has been, was done a long time ago. And so we've kind of extrapolated and borrowed from other states. So if you don't have the actual data for your soil test and how the, the, the plant will respond to a particular treatment, you're kind of just guessing uh, in terms of what response we have. And again, in my, in my state in South Carolina, 
the, the soils that we were looking at um, uh, based on our land grant university tests demanded that we put about 100 pounds an acre of uh, potassium or K2O, which is probably close to about 160 pounds of myriad of potash per year. Yet we never saw any response to that. Uh, conventional wisdom uh, was that we were insane and we were going to lose our mind, you know, we were going to lose our shirts with that. But we ne never saw any crop responses. So the way I look at soil tests is usually I like to kind of look at trends over time. Because um, what we have seen is that if you stop applying P and K, you, your, your soil test values aren't just going to drop through the floor. Especially Now, we've only done that with cover crops. Um, I'm more inclined as, as I go along to start looking at soil tests that use less harsh um, extraction methods like the Haney test um, or, or the Morgan, some of the Morgan tests. Uh, but you, again, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I, I, again, a lot of the beef that a lot of people have with the Haney test is show us where the data are. But I would also say that, you know, you, you look across the country and the data we collected on crop response to nutrient recommendations came from 40, 50, 60 years ago when soils looked very different to what they are today. Based upon what you know and you've seen and maybe what you think, do you think in a system that grows a cash crop, meaning a crop that will be removed off the property, that farmers could survive going amendment-less, where you are not adding amendments or inputs to the soil and the cash crops don't suffer. Now, say you could, the amendments you could bring in would be, say, cover crops, or maybe that's grazing animals, but you're not putting chemical supplements into the soil. Is amendment-less, input-less farming possible, or would it fall back to that kind of conventional wisdom of you're mining your soils, and if you don't add, eventually you're going to run out? Yeah, okay, so that's a great question. So rule of thumb is 80% of a plant's energy is going to come from the atmosphere. So we, we think of uh, elements like nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, makes up about 80% of the plant uh, if if not more, um, so my answer would be in in a the answer the simple answer would be yes, but the caveat would be that you've got to get your soil to that point. You've got to build it up, um, and 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 how is that? You know, because I've heard of this uh, being described by somebody as a perpetual motion machine, and one of the things that we keep on we forget is that um, the most important energy source for, for farms, it comes from the, from the sun. So we're getting, uh, Dwayne Beck once uh, said this, and, and I, I'll never forget it. It was a farmer's job is to harvest sunlight and water. Um, and so as a farmer harvests sunlight and water, so that's going to be the energy, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen for that matter in a good system, uh, the, the rest of the mineral energy can come from the soil. Now, uh, if you've got a system like Gabe Brown has, and, and there are a few guys that are already in that system, it's, and it's not just, it's not just Gabe Brown, it's a lot of, it's a lot of guys. Um, they are, they are working, um, in a situation where the, the sun, Sunlight harvested is essentially driving the rest of the system. Um, it's just going to be made much easier when you've got diversity, when you've got animals on the farm as well. So the short answer is yes, but there's a, there are a lot of caveats to that. In terms of mining your soil, um, well, <laughs> Richard Mulvaney also said, well, um, I, I guess you could mine the soil and deplete the soil. It's a little bit trying to deplete the the, the salt from the ocean. You know, it's 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 that's a long it's 
it's a long-term thing and there's always minerals underneath your A horizon um, as you go down. And again, it's not something I've articulated properly, but that is not a, a you know, in the short to medium term, that, that is not, not a concern. I think the concern is to return farms to a, a regenerative future. Let's go back to some of your aquatic systems background. If you think about aquatic systems, do we have a better understanding of those than we do soil systems? When I got my PhD, I think I was still very much, uh, uh, my mindset was in engineering. Yeah. And so it was all about, let's fix this problem. You know, okay, well, we've got a problem with polluted water. Let's put in a, a grass strip and a, and a buffer, and that's going to fix the problem. Uh, so there was no kind of, okay, well, we've, we've put a, a diaper, you know, we've put a diaper practice on it, um, but we never actually um, found the underlying cause of the problem. So we thought, well, runoff is the problem. And in fact, you know, uh, runoff is not our problem. Infiltration is our problem. So if you, th if you have a mindset that says, okay, well, we need to put all of these catch ponds and uh, buffer strips in, you miss the opportunity to say, well, what if we increased infiltration through keeping the soil covered, through keeping a live root in the soil? It completely changes your mindset. So I th <laughs> it's, it's, again, a little bit difficult to sort of comment on that on my background. Again, it was just the basic discipline and really kind of the desire to, 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 to make some sort of positive change in the community. I just felt really, really frustrated as an aquatic scientist. You know, any kind of improvement was directly dependent on government funding, whereas I think the, the, the opportunity I saw Remember, I'm in a school of public health. The opportunity I saw, the biggest bang for the buck, I would think, is if you got farmers excited about soil health and about regenerating systems. So just in the small, you know, area of influence I've had, you know, tens of thousands of acres of farmers who have rethought the whole idea of more on fertilizer uh, and and started doing cover crops and things and, and certainly not just directly to me. Uh, farmers trust farmers better, so it's th th there's that knock on effect. Yeah, and hopefully podcasts and interviews like this will help get some farmers interested in regeneration. And I, I share an engineering background with you, and I come at it from a problem solving mindset. Yet I, I think a lot of when you look at soils, it's not really what can I do to solve this problem. A lot of times it's, it's what can I not do? And you go back to more of a natural system and you have, you know, the five principles of soil health. Can you run through those? Because I think those are problem solving steps that people can use to turn soil, but it's not add this, do more of this, do more of this. It is a lot of backing off a little bit and letting nature more take the reins. Yeah. Well, we, we need to distinguish between practices and principles. So a practice would be uh, cover crop. A practice might be, you know, no-till. Uh, or a practice might be a certain kind of tillage uh, or even, you know, livestock fencing. So practices are the details that we can implement, you know, once we understand the system. Um Princip the, the five principles of soil health, as I remember, as I learned them, was number one: keep disturbance to a minimum. That, that's minimum physical, chemical, and biological disturbance. Um, and keep in mind that farming is noth nothing other than managing disturbance. Because when we plant a corn crop in the ground of what was formerly prairie land, you know we are disturbing the system, but we're trying to keep that disturbance to a minimum. Uh, so first is keeping, uh, uh, sorry, minimum disturbance, keeping the soil covered either with a layer of residue or a living uh, canopy. Third one is um, uh, 
sorry, <laughs> a keep alive root in the soil year round. So um, that's again related to having a canopy up there. But if you're keeping live roots in the soil year round, do you have a way of, or as many days of the year as possible, you have a way of harvesting sunlight and indeed water because I think, you know, your infiltration rates increase, especially around the plant and the plant roots. But the, 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 the plant harvests the sunlight and then feeds the soil microbes. So uh, keep the soil, uh, minimum disturbance, keep the soil covered, keep a live root. The, the fourth one is diversity, diversity, diversity. So this is um, starting to diversify not only through crop rotations, but uh, add a lot of diversity through multi-species cover crops. So, you know, if you did corn and soybeans, but you had, you know, 10 species in your cover crop, all of a sudden you're going from two species every two years to 12 species every two years. Um, you throw a, a warm season cover crop in there and all of a sudden you're going up to 20 species. And then the fifth one, and which a lot of people argue is part, part B of the fourth uh, principle of diversity, is uh, integrate livestock back into your system. Because our systems really were never designed to work without livestock. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more of an emphasis there. And we see that as a rule of thumb, I think guys who incorporate livestock back into their cropping systems uh, are seeing bigger improvements. So just going back up because I have a lot of commentary, minimum disturbance, keep the soil covered, keep a live root in the soil, diversity, 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 and then keep livestock in the system. Is there one of those that you think that if, if farmers started to do more of that, they would see a huge change? I, I get they're five, they're all interconnected, they're all important, but is there one on that list that they could potentially have more of a leverage effect to it? Well, well actually, um, when we talk about keep alive, keep the soil covered with a canopy, keep alive root in the soil and diversity, diversity, diversity. Multi-species cover crops actually really tick the, check the boxes for all three. So we have seen farmers be transformed in the way they think by multi-species cover crops. So it's, it captures their imagination. They can go in and see um, with their own eyes, what those multi-species cover crops do, either in the reducing of inputs or in, in, in the coastal plain of South Carolina, um, a lot of the farmers that I know never saw earthworms in their field. And within about a year or so after having cover crops, uh, many guys coming and saying, where did, where did the earthworms come from? So, um, to answer your question, the one practice not that covers the three principles would be multi-species cover crops. That's certainly what I've seen. You know, I think farmers like that feedback. It's very visual, and you can also feel it, you know, the, the soil underground, and, and you can smell it, you know, you can pick that soil and it smells like a forest floor. So I would say that that's, that's where you'd probably want to start is, is those multi-species cover crops. Do you have any case studies or farms that you visited throughout the years that you could kind of walk through an iteration of they didn't, they weren't using the practice of multi-species cover cropping to now they are, and these are some of the changes that they saw just to put a little bit of numbers behind it. Yes. I've, I actually have two case studies. Um, um, do you want me to talk about them now? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, l let's go for the, the simpler one is uh, a guy called Jason Carter um, who lives close to Columbia, South Carolina. He started his first cover crop about seven or eight years ago. And... 
The second year that he, and the first year he did his multi-species cover crop, he got so frightened of the biomass, he terminated it in February. So um, in South Carolina, you know, things started start to green up. But when his cover crop got to, I, I think, knee high, he, he really kind of got worried about planting into that. Um, Jason farms in a coastal plain soil. And um, he and I started uh, a, um, he was one of five farmers I started a conservation innovation grant, a USDA grant uh, with. And, and so we, he gave me 15 acres along with uh, four other farmers to look at. And uh, the idea over three years was that we would put multi-species cover crops in. And uh, what we uh, what we noticed was he, he had a, basically a corn soybean rotation and we put cool season cover crops in, I think four species or, or basically four uh, was uh, rye, uh, hairy vetch, crimson clover and daikon radish. So when he, uh, he harvested his corn, he would then plant that cover crop. When he harvested his soybeans, he would do the same. Um, possibly the most important number that we have found there was that his organic matter on that particular field went up from uh, went up about sixty to seventy percent. So the numbers I'm remembering are about from 0.9 percent to 1.6 percent. So that was on a sandy coastal plain or a uh, soil. Um, uh, one of the other things that in that experiment that we noticed was that um, at the end of the first growing season, when we went back to do our soil tests, we noticed that Jason, uh, the, the, the soil test phosphorus and potassium that I was assured would drop like a stone, um, we noticed that the soil test phosphorus and potassium were almost identical to what they were at the beginning of the grow or the previous year. So I went to my five farmers. They each had gave me 10 to 15 acres. And I said, how about we just don't fertilize this year? <laughs> so they, they trusted me. I don't know why they trusted me, but they did. And uh, this happened on all the other guys' farms. But Jason, ha Jason hasn't had uh, he hasn't added phosphorus or potassium on this sandy coastal plain soil uh, for seven years, and we still see steady phosphorus and potassium soil test values. Our um our, our organic matter has increased, and um, our soil test pH has actually increased. So um, his, his soil test pH is about 6.5 and 6.6, .6, and typically he was adding lime every second year. So just on those inputs, Jason has saved a lot of money. Um, he still, oh, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, with his cover crop, and then um, he also adds um, – uh, manure every second year when he grows corn. Uh, he puts 50 units of nitrogen on, and when it rains well, he, he gets 150 bushels of corn. So conventional wisdom says you've, to get 150 bushels of corn over here in this state, you have to add 150 plus another 20 pounds of nitrogen to the soil, and, and we just haven't seen that. So Jason's yields have stayed the same or uh, they may be improving, but his input costs have gone down. His soil test values remain static on the P and K, and his um, his calcium, uh, not calcium, his uh, his pHs have stabilized as well. P pretty amazing benefits just from putting in some cover crops. Right, right. Well, you know, and, and someone would argue, well, what if we didn't put any cover crops? And I'd say, yeah, I think. You know, that's really worth an experiment. But imagine what the implications would be is then 
Uh, does that mean the soil science of all those previous years was wrong in any case? So, you know, yeah. um, we attribute those the stabilizing to to uh, cover cropping, uh, and certainly, you know, adding the chicken litter every second year, I would also imagine helps. He he puts one to two tons a year uh, every second year on. What are the potential cons to cover cropping? I mean, cause there's gotta be people who are saying like, I'm not just not going to do that. Is it the worry that they're going to spend the money on the seed and not get the return on the money? Like, is there a risk of, of doing it? And why wouldn't you do it? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. Let me just add one other thing uh, on Jason's thing. And then let's circle back to that question is we have noticed uh, infiltration increases and so whenever we have a five-inch rainstorm, the water runs off from his neighbors and basically infiltrates into his land. So every drop of rain that Jason gets essentially stays on his farm. Now, um, when we get excess runoff, <laughs> uh, um, that is a problem, but that's also got to do with everything that's upland. But when you have a, a, a raindrop you know, even a one to two inch storm on his his property, you know, it's going to sink straight in. Uh, okay, so circling back, uh, can you just ask that question again to yeah, me? Yeah, people hear that, all the benefits of cover crops. It's pretty amazing. It, it almost feels like a free lunch in a way. What yet? Not everybody's doing cover crops. What are some of the reasons you hear farmers say, I'm not going to do it? Is it the worry I'm going to spend the money on the seed, spend the time, plan it, and I'm not going to get the return? Okay, well, the, the funny answer, the funny and, and silly answer is that you lose tractor tires because you have a lot of deer antlers in the field. Okay. So your tractor tire consumption does go up. Okay. Um, one of the... Um, objections is that this is just an added cost and then there's no uh, thought given to some of those benefits because I think farmers have been inculcated to believing that if you if you cut back on any kind of chemical inputs um, you know you're, you're going to have a disaster on your hand so um, if you're a farmer and you're not penciling in a profit and then you're being told by somebody with a funny accent like me that cover crops are going to help you. You know, you're saying the guy's lost his nuts, you know, he's lost his marbles uh, because he's asking me to spend $30 on seed, uh, 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 an acre on seed, and then I still got to drill it in. And then what do I do in terms of terminating the cover crop and planting into it? So, so it would be the added expense. I think uh, the the other concern many farmers have had, and you know, it's been met with so much YouTube stuff, is how do I plant into ten thousand pounds of residue? Because you know, when that when that cover crop, you know, warm season cover crop, cool season cover crop, gets up to about shoulder height, you know, you know, you've got about ten to even 18,000 pounds, dry pounds per acre of residue, how do you plant into that? So there are a lot of guys who plant in green, some of them terminate, and so there's a lot of back and forth on that. But planting into it is, is another problem. Um, I think farmers are also told that, you know, you get green bridging. Uh, and and I, I, I don't disagree with this is that sometimes you get pest carryover. So, for instance, you know, there may be certain cover crop species that um, uh, that are hosts to nematodes, for example, and they will carry those across. Um, I'm not an expert on that, so there's only anecdotal evidence that I have. But, um, you know, I've seen in some cases that where we had uh, a crimson clover uh, there, you know, we did see in the following corn crop, we did see um, spiral nematodes in our field. But I went to another farm that had a, an active growing crimson clover cover crop and I looked there and I, I didn't find any. So, uh, you know, 
the, the jury's, as far as I'm concerned, the jury's out. But again, I think um, I've had to learn that that I shouldn't be dismissive. And, you know, my, my stance was always, you know, if you've got multi-species cover crops out there, nature's going to take care of herself. And I don't think that's always the case. I think we've got to be very intelligent about choosing cover crops. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not always um, sure exactly where that goes. So I often trust uh, what the farmers I work with see, you know, what they see. And then I kind of try and confer, you know, try and collect evidence that either confirms or, or uh, refutes a particular hypothesis that they have. But if you go back, it's going to be that added expense. And, and how do I plant into that? And then the disease. Yeah, because if you adhere to your base principle number one, that's no tillage or minimum disturbance. You got to do a roller crimp. It's got to just die off seasonally. And then you're, you are left with all that residue, which I guess also mimics principle number five. I mean, that is essentially the animal grazing. I get you're missing the urine, the dung, all the other microbes that the animals bring, but at least you're getting the quote, you know, trample that a livestock would bring only you're bringing it in with diesel fuel. Mm, yeah. I'm not, not sure if I agree with you on, on that, that fifth principle, but yeah, you know, I think most of the farmers I work with still work with herbicides. So, you know, they're going to they're going to go over it and and terminate that. I think the holy grail for many of us is how are we going to be able to terminate our cover crops without herbicides and especially when you've got multi multi species cover crops with different maturation dates. So, um but uh, there is, a, I don't know if you've ever heard, heard of a Phillips harrow. We, um, there are a few of the farmers that I work with that want to save their grain drills. So they, they go ahead and spread their cover crop out. You know, usually it's a 30 to 40 foot pattern and they run over it with the Phillips harrow. And, and so this is on, on a crop that's been harvested. And that looks like a herd of bison have just gone over it. So Phillips Harrow, um, you know, is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one of them, but you know, it's, uh, um, it doesn't actually penetrate the soil, but it, you'd have to look it up because I'm, I'm going to not be able to describe it. But when you pull it along, you can pull it along at 8, 10 miles an hour. And, it, you know, you could have Phillips Harrows between, you know, 30 and, and 40 foot wide. And uh, they just disturb the surface of the soil, and they they tend to give you the seed to soil contact. And that in that case, that the process of planting the cover crop may, to some extent, uh, emulate hoof action of 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 um, of animals. Yeah, and looking at one for people listening, it almost looks like a, a spiked rod, a rod with a bunch of spikes, almost like a a roll brush that somebody would use to brush out their hair, a cylindrical tube, a bunch of rods sticking out that rolls, pokes the soil. What I found with farmers uh, who have sort of committed wholeheartedly to cover crops, I've got a farmer who has 6,000 acres. And so he's got 1,700 acres usually in the fall, or, or you know, usually he's dealing with about 1,700 acres that he's either planting or putting in cover crops. Um, you know, he can probably put about 200 acres of cover crop in with his Phillips harrow, whereas you're not, you, you're not going to do that with the grain drill. Uh, you're using a little bit more cover crop seed, but you're saving a lot of time. And if timeliness is something that you, you know, that's important, and, and often with farmers it is, that saves a terrific amount of time. Given your chemical engineering background and chemistry background, do you have any thoughts on this? Termination of cover crops with an herbicide, is there any sort of comparison in terms of the soil on a herbicide terminated cover crop versus in an organic system, which uses, say, a mechanical means to terminate that same cover crop? In other words, is, are the soil microbes being affected at all 
in your studies? Have you seen anything like that by that herbicide? Right. I, I've not done any sort of um, comparisons. If you'd have asked me five years ago, I would have said that tillage is always more destructive than herbicides. Um, I spent two days with uh, Dr. Don Huber out in Emporia, Kansas at Gail Fuller's Field School. And I got the living daylight scared out of me as he spoke about uh, Roundup and then all the adjuvants that are part of it. So, so I think we're in a world right now where, where we, um, we're dealing or we don't even know what some of the unintended consequences are of some of these chemicals that we have, many of them, you know, I, th I, I believe Roundup is just the poster child, but many of these things are uh, chelators and they're chelating a lot of the essential minerals that we have. Um, and uh, Francis Chaboussou wrote a book called Healthy Plants, where he brought up a, a, a thing of trophobiosis and basically his thing was that the chemicals that we're using and the excess nitrogen we're using actually just makes plants more tasty for pests because pests are essentially the, the demolition crew and they come in and demolish plants that are unhealthy. Um, I also hear of anecdotal evidence that pest pressure now is way higher than it used to be. So it makes me think that gradually we have um, become used to systems that are so full of pesticides and plants that are extremely unhealthy. So they're very unhealthy. So what do we have to do? Well, they're attacked by pests. What do we have to do? We have to spray them. Um, what does that do? That lowers the photosynthetic activity in the plant, uh, which makes it more susceptible to, um, to pest species. So I think we're in kind of a downward spiral there. And um, so again, going back, I don't have comparative numbers, so I, I couldn't speak authoritatively on that, but I have a suspicion that um, our production agriculture system uh, has moved us to more and more unhealthy soils. And I, you know, I don't know whether certain kinds of tillage systems, and I know this is sacrilege to my soil health brothers and sisters, but, you know, are there tillage systems that may be less destructive than some of the herbicides that we're using? So it's a, it's a question that I would have been absolutely on the side. No, we need to use herbicides because tillage is extremely damaging. Now I'm not 100% sure on that. But I think there are unintended consequences when we use herbicides and pesticides. Do you think tillage should be more measured on a curve? I, I hear a lot about no-till, and one of the biggest gripes about no-till is people see small things like even maybe that Phillips hair and they'll say, well, that's tillage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yep. Yeah, yeah. It's just not a hard definition. And, and maybe, you know, obviously one, if I till one inch into the soil, that's going to be less destructive than if I mold board plow it 12 inches deep and really invert the soil. So is there a curve of quote damage when it comes to tillage? Right. I'm a complete agnostic on tillage, so I wouldn't be able to answer that. I um, Again, I heard on one of the John Kempf podcasts, I wish I knew the name of the guy, but he was talking about certain kinds of tillage being uh, worse than others. And one of, the, one of the things that surprised me was he said, you know, when you've got tines, that sort of tillage is less destructive than when you've got uh, something like a... Um, a disc, a disc, uh, you know, a disc system. Uh, but again, I, I'm, I'm a complete ag agnostic on tillage, okay. so I wouldn't be able to really tell you. Although, you know, instinctively, you know, 
um, the moldboard plow, if you're, if you're plowing stuff that might have been, if you're bottom plowing and, and you're bringing it up, I've, I've seen guys that have done that and their soils are, in this part are terrible. You know, they're bringing in sandy systems, they're bringing that clay to the surface. And when they bring the clay to the surface and it's left fallow for, you know, a few weeks in the baking sun, guess what happens to that clay? It turns into pottery. So they've got pottery on their land. So I, I'm not a big fan of tillage, but um, I'm, I'm beginning to be a little bit worried about some of these herbicides that we're using. And I, I don't know what that solution is. So ideally, the whole, like you said, the holy grail is a way to terminate cover crops, no tillage, no sprays. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you do that, you're going to have to be judicious. You, you know, the best way to do that would be to find a cover crop that terminates easily. And probably, you know, the best way, you know, I've been speaking to some or organic hemp guys. And, uh, you know, they, they were really interested in soil health, but their multi-species cover crop you know, the rye might have died, but the hairy vetch carried on growing. So, you know, if you if we're going to do this well, we would probably have to select a species, make sure it, it, it matures on time, and then when we mechanically terminate it, uh, it, it, it all terminates at the same time. So it is a holy grail. I think um, Rodale Institute probably has a lot of research on that where they – till every third year for perennial weed species. What about this? Given your growing apprehension around chemical sprays, herbicides, given the reluctance to till, is planting a single species cover crop that terminates easily mechanically better than multi-species cover cropping that you don't know how to terminate and get your next crop in? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think uh, I've probably got livestock supporters. If they're listening, you know, they're going to say, you idiot, it's livestock. So <laughs> when, you bring, when you bring livestock into your system, I think livestock often is going to um, is gonna help uh, fix a lot of those problems yeah. because, you know, livestock's, uh, you know, livestock love things like palmer amaranth as long as it's not too big. Uh, to answer you, in terms of one system or the other, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, I suspect that if we're going to move this forward, we're going to have to think about, you know, adding that livestock component. What about in terms of the P and the K in the system? In a cover cropping system, you've gone through a couple of case studies where the levels are staying the same. They're not dropping, and we're not adding P and K into the system externally. Yep. The plants obviously need them biologically to perform. Can you walk through the cycle of what is happening with that P and K in the soil that it's being used by the plant when the plant needs it, when the plant's growing? The plant dies the P and the K aren't just going up to the sky and going away. They're ending up back in the soil because if those measurements are staying the same or increasing, we're concentrating them in the soil. How is the plant using them and then getting them back into the soil where those levels stay the same or increase? Okay, yeah. And, and let me just add, this is only my experience in coastal plant soils. You know, for instance, in the one Thing where we were looking at the potassium concentrations, we did notice slow uh, drops of soil test phosphorus over time, but we never saw phosphorus deficiencies. Uh, again, I think this goes back uh, to, to get to your question, I think this just goes back to harvesting sunlight. So when we're harvesting sunlight with a cover crop, um, we we then are accessing mineral nutrients in the soil uh, through root exudates and then through interactions with soil microbes. Those mineral nutrients were not there or, or were not available in the past. The, the cover crop then grows up, it dies, uh, and then some of those nutrients are passed on. 
Potassium, for instance, you know, is always in the inorganic form and it goes back into the soil before the plant dies or it actually just leaches out of the plant in the soil. So there are, again, many different methods. Uh, but you also talk about the, the removal of, um, you, you know, things like nitrogen and, or at least phosphorus uh, from, from the system through grain removal. Um, so, you know, we're, we're seeing that uh, removal, but we're not seeing, you know, we're seeing slow decreases in soil test P, but we haven't yet seen in our situation soil test P, uh, P deficiencies. Uh, I know um, a few guys in North Dakota who haven't had added synthetics for over 20 years. Their soil test values in that particular, you know, especially something like P, have gone down to places that would scare the dickens out of agronomists, but their, their plant tissue P is just fine. And so I think um, we're seeing much more in nature, much more of a just-in-time system where the P is mobilized when it's needed from the, from the minerals in the soil. And the only way you can mobilize that is through improving your soil biology. Do you think the idea of looking at plant tissues is something maybe more farmers should embrace to see what's actually in the plants when they're growing that whole just in time system? If it's pulling your soil test may not show it, but the plants definitely going to show it when it's mid growth. And then you're going to know, am I short on it? Do I have it? Maybe I'm all good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a year ago I would have said absolutely. Yes. Cause you know, this is how, I've weaned some of the farmers that I work with on on off fertilizer because we we went in and we found, for instance, I think in the fir sort of 2015 to 2017, where we stopped applying phosphorus fertilizer, we had two out of 500 uh, deficiencies in phosphorus, and that was on corn in the early part of the season. Uh, we went back the next week and those deficiencies were uh, were no longer there. Uh, we did the same with potassium where we found that that plant potassium was up and down, not based on what the supply was, but was based more on what the um, what the weather was. So I think it's a it's a good report card, but um, what I've become more aware of more recently is that, a plant may experience a particular deficiency, uh, or you might see those symptoms of a particular deficiency in the plant leaves or roots, uh, but the, the plant tissue test comes back just fine. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm to understand is that some of the uh, minerals in that plant tissue may be chelated inside the plant tissue itself. So therefore, while it's inside the plant tissue, it may not be available to that system. Um, I also, so I think plant tissue tests are of limited use uh, in terms of maybe weaning ourselves off some of the high input numbers that, that we're used to. But uh, the, the newer sort of buzzword, and I haven't done any of this, is looking at plant sap analysis r rather than the plant tissue analysis and beginning to take a deeper dive in, in those, especially maybe looking at a differential between your newer growth and your older growth. So I, I think these are, are useful. Going back, uh, plant tissue tests are probably useful, especially in your gross macronutrients um, as, uh, to kind of reassure you that you're not sort of um, uh, hurting yourself when you grow your crops. Um, but probably plant sap analyses may be a little bit more precise. In, in With the row crop farming guys that I work with, probably in the final analysis, it's, it's maybe the farmer's eyes that, that tell us the most. In the past, I've said, don't worry, you know, it'll all work out itself out. Um, and I think more and more I need to start trying to understand 
maybe some of the visuals that we're seeing in crops and being able to say, well, that does look like a boron deficiency. Let's use some kind of foliar fertilization. How do you see foliar fertilization fitting in to this? If the soils are healthy, working, that mineral pump is going, powered by the sun, where yeah. does foliar feeding come in? Are you just doing what now you used to do to the soil, where you used to just add stuff to the soil, now we're going to put it on the plant instead? Right, right. Well, remember your foliar fertilization, uh, you're using order of magnitude, orders of magnitude less and it, it's less about the NPK that you're putting out there. It's, it's probably going to focus on some of the micronutrients and a little bit of phosphorus and small amounts of nitrogen. But um, what I understand about foliar fertilization is that, that your uptake in the plant is much higher. So the advantage might be that you can um, supplement the nutrients in a crop uh, and the supplementing of those nutrients in a crop in a, in a system that might still be on its way to getting better uh, would be useful and profitable. I don't know how useful and profitable it would be in row crops where commodity prices are really awful right now. So I think theoretically we can address some nutrient shortfalls through foliar spraying, but I think the question is, you know, is there a benefit, especially when commodity prices are terrible? With your chemistry background, what might be the benefits of foliar feeding over root feeding? Part of me is saying, well, the roots are designed to uptake nutrients. Why am I not soil drenching these micronutrients versus foliar feeding them through a leaf which has some ability to take in nutrients, but it can't be as effective as a root, or is it as effective? What What are your thoughts on that? What do you know on that? What's your intuition tell you? Well, again, foliar feeding, very, very much smaller amounts, and uh, but the uptake in the plant leaves can be much quicker. Um, so foliar feeding may more be in the line of correcting over time, uh, but but I, I have to say I'm still really in kindergarten to be able to really address this. I think foliar feeding also probably, you know, you're going to have to do it every 10 to 14 days, so go back and back and back, and that's where I think the profitability or the cost-benefit analysis has to be looked at. But again, you know, this is only something I've entertained sort of since the beginning of this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, you'll, you'll have to ask other people who understand foliar feeding a lot better than me. If we go back to those five base principles, minimize soil disturbance, keep a cover, keep a root in the ground, if it was possible with a row crop, and a lot of people listening to this, they're not necessarily growing row crops. I know you have a lot of experience with row crops. They're growing smaller crops of vegetables. Yeah, yeah. Do you see a system where if I could grow a perennial type cover crop, keep that in the soil all the time and grow that alongside of my cash crop, that that is, is kind of your dream system where there's maybe not 365 all year round, depending on where you live, but for the majority of the year, you have that cover crop in there, you have the cash crop in there, they're both growing symbiotically, and the cover crop, you're not necessarily worried about terminating it, you're just more worried about keeping it alive so that carbon pump is working and the microbes are feeding off of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know of uh, at least one instance where that in fact happens. There's a few guys uh, in Georgia, one guy I specifically met, and he had a crimson clover cover crop, and I think he's made, uh, added a little bit of white clover in that. And uh, he essentially strip tills into that crimson clover, and uh, his corn and cotton then come up in that strip. And by the time the strip closes with the the the, the clover cover crop, his crop is well on its way. So I think those um, those systems. Uh, are 
are definitely something one should aim for. I think Elaine Ingham was doing some work with a, a bunch of different people on looking at natural ground creeping cover, you, you know, natural uh, plants like ponies foot that, that typically sat on the ground and covered the ground and then putting cash, cash crops in between those. So that's, you know, that certainly is, is a, another way to do it. You know, if you're not spending money on cover crops, how, how cool would that be? What about nature's cover crops? I mean, what about weeds? There is this huge idea in ag that, that weeds are bad. They don't fit into the system. And if you have low growing weeds, like a purslane or something like that, that's, that's at the low and you're growing corn where you're harvesting way above it. Right. Do you see any sort of competition or is that a, a wrong that is just kind of came up through ag where those weeds need to be removed because they're not stealing nutrients away from the crop and maybe they're making the system better. What are your thoughts on weeds coexisting with cash crops? Have you ever seen this book, Managing Weeds Without Poisons by Charles Walters? I think I've heard of that one. I have not read that one. Yeah. So he, I think he's the founder of Acres USA. Um, and then, of course, he refers to other things. And and, and really what Charles Walters says is that weeds, weeds tell us about, that they speak to us about what's happening in the soil. So um, going back to your question about purslane, you know, something that would be a ground, a natural ground cover, theoretically in between corn, I don't, I don't see would be a problem. I think it's a question of us learning how to understand weeds again or weedy species. And they're there typically as a symptom of what's happening in the soil. Um, I, I don't know that we should be just leaving weedy species out there if we're, say, doing row crops. But I think um, the definition of a weed is a plant out of place was a was, was something that allowed uh, the, the development of chemicals, <laughs> well, not allowed, but justified the, the development of chemicals. And I think that the better we understand weedy species and what they're telling us, uh, the better we're, we're gonna be able to manage them. Again, if we have cows, that's not a problem. I would, I would be hesitant to tell my row crop farmers just to leave the weeds going. Um, one of the things that we have in the southeast would be henbit and chickweed, which um, are not very so, – so, you know, there's a big argument. I'll oh, just let the henbit and chickweed grow, um, and, you know, we can terminate that. And when you terminate those, you know, there's, there's basically nothing left. They just kind of meld into the soil. Um, I'm not a great fan of them because they don't pr pr provide that much biomass – and they don't provide much ground cover um, either. But I would not rule out being able to look at some of the natural, quote unquote, weedy species that we have and see how, you know, how do we fit those into our, our, our systems. Again, I've, I've tended to be maybe a little bit narrow minded on your conventional cover crop species without going into say what someone like Charles Walters has, has been talking about 50 years ago. And you have that book like by Charles. And I think some people look at that with an ag and they say that's pseudoscience. It's a bit woo woo. What's the current feeling or understanding in academia from your perspective of weeds? Are they a plant out of place or, or do we have any sense of when weeds show up, this is why this particular weed is here. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, I'm, I'm, I'm not from an agricultural school. I'm, I'm from a school of public health, so I come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, I'm also not an ecologist, an ecologist, but if we had a, a more ecological understanding of weeds, um, you know, I think that's going to be better for the farmer and the environment. If we, you know, we, if we have a purely production ag related focus on weeds, that weeds just need to be gotten out of the way and we need to grow 
our crops to the maximum yield at all expenses, including of the farmer, and that's that's a Wendell Berry quote, um, then it's a whole different thing. So, so um, I, th I think a lot of it, again, this is just my thinking, a lot of it is just basically driven by, by money. You, you don't sell product if you say, well, let's figure out how we can work with Mother Nature, you know, what plants are, are going to work with us and, and how does this work? It, it just doesn't sell product. And that goes to, you know, herbicides, pesticides, um, chemicals. And I, I'm not anti the use of, you know, fertilizers and things like that. But I think, um, you know, the scientific questions that have been asked uh, often are, are skewed towards uh, what would make the in industry more money. Have you observed anything anecdotally from maybe farms you visited, Gabe Brown, someplace like that, where somebody's done a long term of no-till, min-till, cover crops, they've really built up healthy soils. Have you ever seen a correlation where you could say, this soil looks better, it looks less weedy to me? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we, we see that all the time. Um, I'm I've been fortunate in that I work in, you know, in um, in South Carolina, South Dakota. I've been to Idaho, um, uh, Colorado. Uh, so number one, uh, it's much easier for me to see and to touch and to smell and to say whether soil is healthy or not. And so you've got people like Brendan Rocky, for instance, who is in Colorado and he farms potatoes, but he doesn't only farm potatoes. He will rotate that out every three years with quinoa. But not only that, he also has a, a cover crop that he grazes. And not only that, he's going to put companion crops in it. And so, uh, you know, Brendan doesn't really have much of a weed problem. You know, he probably does. He does elect to use herbicides if he needs to. But um, in his system, weeds are less of a problem. The guys in the southeast that I work with, um, uh, that's in South Carolina and then North Carolina and Georgia, the guys who have been cover cropping and have been experienced in this a long time, Palmer amaranth, which is a is just a huge problem in conventional fields. Palmer amaranth is just a not, not a problem to these guys. Uh, Jason Carter, I think, usually now he hand weeds most of his fields of, of Palmer amaranth. So the answer is yes, you can actually see in long-term systems, or not even long-term systems, but systems where you just start keeping the soil covered, your cover crops are going to outcompete uh, a lot of the weeds that were absolute pests in your system. Do you think it's an out competition, or do you think it's the biology has fixed the mineralogy and the weeds aren't trying to rectify a problem because the problem isn't there? If we believe this concept that weeds heal specific things in the soil, yeah. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, th there's both competition, but there's also evidence that in soils that become more and more healthy, um, rem the, remember, for the most part, weedy species, uh, Elaine Ingham has a, a, you know talked about a, a much more helpful definition rather than a plant out of place. Weedy species are going to be uh, typically... Um, small, early successional plants that grow very quickly, uh, produce a lot of seeds, and then die. So um, their interest, if you would want to use that word, is not in generating these mycorrhizal relationships that are usually a characteristic of uh, later successional plants and perennials. Their interest is in growing really, really, really quickly and then producing seed and getting out for the next cycle. 
Um, and what happens is when you get more and more soil structure, more and more mycorrhizal, higher fungal to bacterial ratios, is that um, the the seed no longer is stimulate, stimulated to actually um, uh, germinate. And so it will only germinate if the soil gets disturbed or compressed or compacted or waterlogged or something like that. So I think soil condition, not only in terms of um, your fungal to bacteria or your, your microbial relationships, but I think there's also evidence that, for instance, soil that have very, very high sol soluble calciums uh, really disfavor the growth of weedy species. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. So just, it, it, pardon me? I was just going to it's really interesting when you think about that whole succession and all the interconnected relationships between the mycorrhizal fungi. And I, I was talking to someone else and they were looking at weeds saying, though, they might not form those relationships with mycorrhizal fungi under the soil, but a lot of weed species might form fungal relationships on their leaves because they're early inhabitors or they're more picking up those types of nutrients. So it's a, Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of that. Yeah. yeah you know, I've, I've got some pigweed in my strawberry patch, which is very fungal, but the pigweed is kind of really pathetic looking. You know, I, I don't know if it's going to set seed or anything. So, yeah. So, but, you know, I think it's in terms of a helpful definition of saying weeds are early successional habitat plants. And my general experience is that if we create the soil conditions and then the above ground conditions as well, those seeds, you know, if, if you have something covering the soil, uh, if there's no sunlight getting to that seed and there's no heavy disturbance of, of that land, there's no stimulus for that seed to germinate. To germinate, right, right. You know, shifting gears a little bit here, organic matter and its ties to cation exchange capacity. Cation exchange capacity is another one of those things on a soil test. People see it. I'm not sure they fully understand it from a chemical background. How would you explain that to somebody? And, and how does that tie into increased organic matter and improving soils having a different cation capacity, cation exchange capacity compared to a soil that's poor? Yeah. Well, in your soil test, keep in mind that cation exchange capacity is actually a calculation based on your soil test, um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. So that's actually, if you, um, it's just a formula based on your on those three things, and then it also not assumes, but um, you're also looking at. Uh, those are your your base. That's those are your base cations. You also have at acid cations being uh, the H plus, the aluminum, and then iron. Uh, um, I think those are the main ones. But essentially, um, theoretically, cation exchange capacity is um, how many cations. So cations being those ions with positive charges. How many cations can a soil particle grab onto? Most soil particles have a negative charge, um, and usually this is related to clays. Um, in our part of the world, we have one-to-one -one clays, which are not really uh, – we, we don't have very, very high cation exchange capacity. So we would have in the region of, I think, four – typically four to seven milli equivalents per 100 milligram. Uh, when you go up into the corn belt, you know, you, you might have 20 to 27. Uh, the, the, the kicker about organic matter is that organic matter has a much higher cation exchange capacity. So it's got lots more negative, um, uh, negative sites on it that will hold on to these cations. And my understanding is that organic matter typically for a pound of organic, basically the cation, if you had pure organic matter, the, the CECs are closer to 300. So it stands to reason that when you start adding 10, 20,000 pounds of organic matter, 1% uh, of organic matter is going to be roughly 20,000 pounds 
of organic matter in the top six inches of your soil. When you add that amount of organic matter, it stands to reason that your CECs will increase. Um, yeah, so the what we've seen in, in systems where we, for instance, have not put line is we've actually seen our CECs drop even though the um, the organic matter has gone up by, you know, one to two percent. Right. So theoretically, CECs, you know, should be increasing, but because it's based on a calculation of your soil test, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, um, I don't know that it always specifically re reflects CECs. And I know if you add lime to your system, you're going to artificially raise that CEC if you're capturing uh, that high volume of calcium uh, in your soil test. Well, you know, more calcium in your soil test is not a bad thing, but we just have to be, I, I'm not enough of an expert of CECs, but I am aware that it's, it's a calculation and one has to be careful of it and use it as a general uh, a rule of thumb uh, uh, and, 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 and be just a little bit aware of it. You know, one thing I'm trying to do through this series is encourage people to do more experimenting and try stuff and then know why they're doing what they're doing, not just accept, I like, off a soil test, I should add this. Why should you add it? What's actually going on? And to try and get people to be more citizen scientists. Yeah, when you, that, that's a great idea. Yeah, and when you have something like your results with the Johnson Soup Bioreactor, when you like the system, when you probably fundamentally think, hey, this makes sense, yet you don't get results that line up. How do you tackle that? Like, what advice do you have for somebody who who believes in something and wants to try something, then they do it, and it's just kind of like, yeah. well, I got a nothing burger here. <laughs> well, farmers, you know, good, innovative farmers like to fail at least once a year. Um, I think it's just a question of persistence. And... Um, part of that might just be because you you have a, a mindset that says, okay, well, that didn't work. It's not because David Johnson's system is not good, but it's something that I may or may not have done in my system. You know, I followed uh, the the recipe in my in my case. I followed the recipe. You, you know, it, looking back. Um, Sorry, I'm diverting. So, but but I, I think it's just a question of persistence and uh, understanding that if you meet with a lack of success in something, you know, it's it's back to the drawing board. It's it's you know rethinking th through what could have gone wrong. Uh, asking just ask to answer your question earlier on. You know, it might be that for me, I was taking beneficial microbes and putting them into a system where they didn't really have a great habitat. I would have thought it was a good habitat because it, it's a soil that's getting healthy, but they might have gone out there and, you, you know, subs subsisted off a little bit of milk and molasses that I gave them and then, then they died right there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one thing a lot of people, they don't fully think through, and I'm totally guilty of this, is, is a lot of this stuff is contextual. Like it might work great in one particular biome, but as you know from working in aquatic systems, working with soil, there are some universal principles, minimum tillage, but not everything that works in South Carolina is going to work in California, is going to work in Maine, because those soils, the climates are inherently different. And you just got to try and take what you know works. And maybe there has to be subtle adaptations to get it to work in your system. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Buzz, I want to thank you for taking some time to come on and share everything that you're doing today. For people that want to learn more about the work that you're doing, you have a podcast, uh, you do consulting. If they want to follow along and learn more about you, where can they go? Well, um, 
I, uh, the, the main place that we work at uh, in my labs uh, at the School of Public Health is um, uh, Soil Health Labs. So if you go to Soil Health Labs, plural, on Facebook, you'll see some of the stuff that we do. So we, we work with um, the USDA in South Carolina. Uh, we've got a project uh, that we're doing with Washington, D.C., that, that takes us to Idaho and Colorado. And then we also, uh, uh, Idaho, Colorado, New Mexico, and, and Arizona. And then we've also got a project that we've got with uh, South Dakota called Merit or Myth. Uh, and we're thinking of changing that brand name. But if you follow Merit or Myth, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be telling you, you know, where we're headed. We're probably going to call it Growing Resilience. But the main place is to follow um, Soil Health Labs and to follow some of the stuff that I've done over the last few years on Facebook, I have a page called Dr. Buzz Clute, but you'll see that I have been less active there for the last year. And most of it is, you know, trying to regroup after a lot of a big flurry of activity from uh, how much fertilizer do we really need to um, not good results with my Johnson's to work. Great. Well, thanks again. I'll share it all and I appreciate your work. Well, I appreciate your willingness to speak to me. That's It's been very good. You've asked me some very searching questions. So I, I hope I've done justice to your questions. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.